So in this video, we're going to close out chapter 11 with the second part of colligative properties. So we did in the previous video, we talked about the first part of colligative properties. This will be the second part. And so this is the comprehensive list of uh, the learning outcomes and expectations for colligative properties. You can pause and read through those through the combination of both of those videos. You should be able to do, or it'll give you insights into how to do these uh, learning outcomes and expectations. And so we partitioned colligative properties because it's so long into two parts. Previously, in the previous video and previous lecture, we went through Van't Hoff factor, vapor pressure lowering, and boiling point elevation. And so in this uh, video, we're going to look at freezing point depression as well as osmotic pressure. But briefly, just to remind you, I spent a lot of time talking about intermolecular forces in chapter 10 as well as the first part of chapter 11 where those intermolecular forces dictate properties like viscosity and vapor pressure and then uh, in early chapter 11 we talked about solutions where things like to mix, mix if they're polar or nonpolar as in polar likes to mix with polar, nonpolar with nonpolar. In 11.4, we introduced this idea of colligative properties, this list of four properties here that are basically only dependent on the number of particles in solution and not the nature of those particles. And so you have a pure solution or a pure solvent. You're going to add solute molecules. It'll change the properties. Add solute, solute molecules. It changes them more. And then add, even if you add different solute molecules, as long as the number of molecules is the same, the colligative property changes the same. And so again, colligative properties are only dependent on the uh, number of particles and not the nature of those particles. And so previously we got through this um, vapor pressure lowering and boiling point elevation. Basically, the more you add solute particles, the lower the vapor pressure, which also the more solute molecules you add, consequently, the higher the boiling point. And so that's vapor pressure lowering and boiling point elevation. So now we're going to talk about freezing point depression, which is conceptually very similar to boiling point elevation, but essentially going the opposite direction. And so again, we're in Florida, so you might not be as familiar with this, but the idea of adding salt or de-icer to wings of a plane is this idea of freezing point depression. And so you're using the addition of something to water, either you know on the street or on, on an airplane wing, to make that lower to lower the temperature of freezing. And so basically what ends up happening is if you have a pure solvent, the molecules can interact without obstruction. If you add solute molecules, you start to interfere with that crystallization or that solidification. And so effectively you, you inhibit it from making that crystal. And so it's basically blocking that uh, solid formation. And so that's known as the um, freezing point depression. And so basically the, the freezing temperature of a solution is lower or you have to cool it down more than for a pure solvent. And so you have a pure solvent you have to cool it down more and so if you want to look at this on a thermometer basically you can cool down a container of some kind and if you have a pure substance like a pure liquid a pure solvent um, that's going to freeze at some temperature here and then if you add solute molecules to it you actually lower that temperature so you have to cool it down even more before it's going to freeze and so the language can get a little bit complex from this because you're talking about lowering the freezing temperature or making it colder um, but basically a, a pure solvent will freeze before a solution right because it's going to depend on it, it has to get colder for the solution than it does for the pure solvent also solutions will melt before pure solvents which is why you put salt on the road because you want that ice to melt so it's not slippery so you're turning it from the solid to the liquid and it does so at a earlier temperature or a um, cooler temperature than it would with just the pure solvent um, you must cool down the solution more than pure solvents for them to freeze pure solvents melt at warmer temperatures than the solution and so it's worth looking through these all these say the exact same thing it says as you add solute particles you lower the freezing point you make it essentially harder to freeze that solution and so all these essentially say that same exact thing. And so we have a numerical uh, representation of that through this equation here. And you'll notice this looks a lot like the boiling point elevation. It's almost identical. It says the change in freezing uh, temperature is going to be equal to Van't Hoff factor times molality of solute particles times the Kf. In this case, it's the freezing point depression constant. So this is a constant that's dictated by whatever the nature of the solvent is. Molality is dictated by the number of solute molecules. And so if you know those, plus you know whether it's an electrolyte, whether it dissociates, you can effectively calculate the temperature change associated with adding those solute molecules to that solution.
And so like I said, if that equation looked familiar, it's because it's almost identical. Here's the boiling point elevation equation. Here's the freezing point depression equation. And you can see they take almost identical forms. The difference is the uh, Kb is the boiling point elevation constant. The Kf is the freezing point depression constant dictated by the uh, solvent. And so here you can see a table just from a standard textbook. It gives you the Kf and the Kb values for any given solution. And so if you know the number of particles you add to, say, ethanol, you can figure out one how you change the boiling point how you increase that boiling point or two how you lower the freezing point or how much more you have to cool the solution to make it freeze and so you can do that math directly using these two equations right here we can also look at it in graphical form. So previously, we basically only looked at this portion of the graph here. Um, this is the phase diagram. Previously, we were looking at the claisen clapeyron temperature pressure relationship. Um, but the same idea holds true. Basically, here's your uh, vapor pressure uh, curve right here, where you have gas down here and liquid. The phase transition between those is this line essentially right here. And so when you add solute molecules, you lower that. You lower the vapor pressure, which means you increase the boiling point because you need more heat, more temperature to elevate it to the boiling point. And so there's your pure solvent curve. There's a solution curve after you've added solute molecules. There's the change in boiling point. So you're increasing the boiling point at one atmosphere from here to this temperature here. And that's where that delta TB, that, that boiling point elevation comes from. But you also shift the entirety of this curve. And so this is a, a, a phase diagram. And so we have the phase diagram for the pure solution or pure solvent, which is the solid line. And then when you add those solute molecules, molecules, you change the, the, the phase diagram. And so you shift these curves. And so you shift the gas liquid barrier down, you shift the liquid solid barrier down into the left as well. And so that's where the freezing point depression comes from. And so you're effectively making it harder to freeze. And so as you shift this curve, you have to cool it down more to get to that, um, that freezing, that solid to liquid transition or liquid to solid transition. And that's where this delta TF, your freezing point depression. And so you're making it harder to boil you have to go higher in temperature to boil it you're making it harder to freeze uh, goes to the left until you get the freezing point and the the degree of that process is going to be dictated by how many solute particles you add and so this dashed line is just one example if you add more solute molecules you move that curve down even further move this curve even further to the left and the amount is going to be proportional to the concentration of the things you add and so that closes out freezing point depression. So we add solute, vapor pressure decreases. We add solute, the boiling point becomes higher. We add solute and the freezing point uh, becomes lower. And the last one we're gonna talk about is osmotic pressure. And osmosis, you probably most commonly heard about this in biology, uh, but basically the idea is it's osmosis is the passage of solvent molecules through a semi-permeable membrane. It basically changes, uh, it wants to move molecules from the dilute solution to the more concentrated one. And so a semi-permeable membrane in this case is a membrane that only lets solvent molecules through. So it stops solute from moving, it only moves solvent molecules through. And so by, by, by far the most common example of osmosis is you using water and salt water. And so if you take pure water and you take some kind of salt solution with a semi-permeable membrane and you put those together, eventually over time, solvent molecules, which is water in this case, will go through that membrane and start filling up this salt solution. So eventually it'll start climbing and climbing and there will be, um, there, there's effectively a force, you have gravity opposing the uh, increase in solute concentration. And so this is what osmotic pressure is. And so it's, it's probably easier to think about this from a, um, a solvent movement type standpoint. And so um, looking at this example, so if you take a closed chamber and you take a solvent and you take a solution, right? And so when you think about a solvent, it's going to have a vapor pressure and then a solution where you've added solute molecules. In this case, those solute molecules are going to lower the vapor pressure here. And so in both cases, you have molecules going out of the liquid phase, but the vapor pressure will be higher for the pure solvent than it is for the solution. And what's crazy about this is what happens over time is eventually all these molecules from the, the pure solvent are going to transfer over to the solution. 
And so you're going to actually end up with a, a case where all the all the uh, liquid, the solvent molecules end up in this one chamber, and these will have completely evaporated because it's, it's faster for molecules to leave this solution than it is for them to leave this solution. And so that's effectively what's happening, but it's happening across a membrane. And so your semi-permeable membrane is just acting like a barrier where you have, you know, solution on one side, pure solvent on the other, and those solvent molecules are allowed to go across that membrane. And so looking at this at a, well, a semi-molecular view, you have a solution on one side and you have pure solvent on the other. And so this is the pure solution, or pure solvent, and this one has solute molecules. And what those solute molecules do effectively mean um, that you have a salt solution here. And so what's going to happen is you're going to have a higher vapor pressure going this direction, then you have this direction. And so what happens over time is uh, molecules are going to move to the right much more than they move to the left. And so eventually you're going to see the volume on this side increase and the volume on this side decrease. And the difference between those two is the osmotic pressure. And so when we use that phrase osmotic pressure, that's effectively what we're talking about. And so Another way to think about it is osmotic pressure is the pressure required to stop osmosis. And so if you had to physically push on this side to lower the concentration and increase the concentration here, that's what the osmotic pressure is. It's basically the amount of force to oppose that, that vapor pressure movement across a barrier. And so that's what it means to have an osmotic pressure. And so again, we have osmosis, the movement of solvent molecules across a membrane from the low concentration to the higher concentration. And we have osmotic pressure, which is the pr pressure required to stop osmosis. And so here's the equation that dictates or that describes osmotic pressure. So you have pi here, which is the osmotic pressure, I, the Van t Hoff fract uh, factor again. M is the molarity or the concentration moles per liter. It's moles of solute per um, liters of the solution. R is a constant. T is the temperature. And so if you know the concentration, you can effectively calculate the osmotic pressure out of the system. And so again, that osmotic pressure represents uh, basically the difference in, in volume between the two after it has reached a steady state condition. So one side you have solute molecules, the other side you have pure solvent. Solvent is going to go across this barrier and uh, decrease this concentration as much as it can. And the difference between those two is the osmotic pressure. And that's effectively what you're calculating here with pi. And so just a fun example, this is kind of a side example, you could essentially take any concentration you want and you could figure out how much it did dictates the osmotic pressure of the system. In this case, uh, I'm just going to show you a cool example of using osmotic pressure to actually calculate the molecular weight of a protein. And so, uh, you know, when they initially isolated proteins before they had crystallography or NMR to figure out what the protein structure is, they didn't necessarily know the size of the protein. And so if you isolate, say, myoglobin, you get a chunk like a gram of myoglobin and you'll know how much mass you have but you won't know how many molecules of myoglobin you might have and so if you want to find figure out the molar mass which is essentially tells you the size of individual um, you know proteins well, how are you going to do that? And so one way to do it is to do osmotic pressure calculations. And so essentially you could take one liter of pure solvent on one side, and then you could take one liter of water and add 35 grams of hemoglobin. So remember, they didn't know the size of, say, hemoglobin. And so instead they took 35 grams of isolated it, and you could put it in this solution right here. And what's really important about this is you can directly measure osmotic pressure, right? You can measure the difference here, the force that would be required to level these off. And let's say you get a number like 0.013 atmospheres at 25 degrees. What's interesting is based on our equation, we know this number, we assume Van Hoff is one, R is known, T is known. And so if you measure pi, you can figure out what the molarity is. And so what's important about this is molarity essentially tells you how many molecules or how many individual proteins you have in this solution. And so rearrange your equation, plug your numbers in, you can effectively figure out the number of moles of protein in there. And so because those are known, you can figure out, um, you can effectively calculate the number of moles. If you know the grams that you put in there, which is 35 grams, and you calculate the moles from this equation, you can figure out the molar mass of the protein. And so what they effectively did in this case, and you can actually do this calculation, you get 5.38 times 10 to the minus 4 moles of hemoglobin, which gives you a mass of 6.5 times 10 to the fourth grams per mole, which is actually pretty close to the molecular weight of um, hemoglobin. Yeah. <laughs>
And so just to recap, it's basically a really convoluted way to figure out how many moles of this protein you have in solution. And if you know the grams and you can figure out the moles from the osmotic pressure, you can actually calculate the molecular weight of the protein. And so again, that's the power of this relationship because it's only dependent on the number of particles, not the nature of it. So it doesn't matter if it's you know, glucose or it's hemoglobin, the osmotic pressure is dictated by the number of moles. And so that's what comes through in this equation right here. All right, so that closes out our four colligative properties. We have vapor pressure lowering, we have boiling point elevation, freezing point depression, and osmotic pressure and the associated equation. And we can't forget the Van't Hoff factor associated with those. And so again, to summarize, we have colligative properties only dependent on the number of particles, not the intermolecular forces. We have freezing point depression. The more solute you add, the harder it is to freeze a solution or the lower you have to uh, decrease the temperature to make that solution freeze. Um, the magnitude of that freezing temperature is going to be directly dependent on the number of solute particles. We also have osmosis, which is essentially the pressure um, change that's generated when you have a pure solvent next to a solution. The more concentrated that solution, the higher the vapor pressure associated with it. And so it's directly proportional to the number of solute molecules in solution. So yeah, that closes out chapter 11. We went through the dissolution process and nomenclature. We talked about electrolytes versus non-electrolytes. We talked about solubility and factors that influence solubility. And finally, we closed out with colligative properties. And so next uh, presentation, we'll dive into chapter 12.